Okay, in this video, I'd like to continue on with my tutorials on electrostatics. This is video number 12, and I'm going to discuss the electric field outside a uniformly charged conducting sphere. I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstories.com, and if you'd like news on what I'm posting or updates and so on, you can follow me on Twitter at adambt503. So the previous video, which is which are relevant to this, are as follows. In number 10, I use Gauss's law on a uh, a, a unit cube, okay, and I had the charge in the corner. In video number nine, it is, I proved Gauss's law. In video seven and video number six, I didn't use Gauss's law, and I tried to calculate the field for an, a, a uniformly charged conducting sphere and a field of a spherical shell. So this video, in, sorry, number seven is the same as video number twelve, which I'm doing now, but the difference, I suppose, is that we're going to use two different methods. Uh, right, that's that. We'll find that. Using Gauss's law where there is symmetry makes things a hell of a lot easier, as videos 6 and 7 show that it was a pain in the face to calculate the electric field where there, was no, um, where there was no symmetry. So first of all, I'm just going to write down Gauss's law. I think that's the, the first point to start. So Gauss's law says the closed surface integral of your electric field taken with the dot product of your infinitesimal surface area element is Q enclosed divided by epsilon 0. Now, after thinking of something which I suppose I probably should have put in my video on Gauss's law. In Gauss's law, what we said was, at, at one point, we said we have an infinitesimal area element, I'm going to call it dA, with the electric field going through it. And we defined the flux of something as going perpendicular to your surface area element. So, in other words, your, your, in this case, your electric field for maximum flux, we'll say max flux, your electric field had to be parallel to your normal vector, okay? But uh, I said that that was the same thing as your electric field being parallel to your, we'll say, your infinitesimal area element. And you might say, well, why is that? And the reason is as follows. Just think about it in your spherical coordinates. Your, if your radius is constant in spherical coordinates, well, the infinitesimal area element is r squared sine theta d phi d theta r hat. In other words, it's radial. Okay, it, it is radial. So if this was, we'll say, there is um, there's my source charge. There is my, we'll say, I, I put a, s a spherical surface around it. So we'll say dA actually has this, that, that's the normal vector to dA, so it's radial. But the electric field will also be radial in this case. Well, it, well, it doesn't necessarily need to be radial, but in, for a spherical surface, it's going to be radial. So the point, anyway, is that... Uh, that dA is actually perpendicular to the surface area, surface area element. Anyway, so in this, what we're trying to do is calculate the electric field due to a charged conducting sphere. And so here's my charged conducting sphere. I'm going to, we'll say, color it in blue, okay? It's got a certain amount of charge on it. And we're trying to calculate the electric field due to this. Now, we should know the answer already. It's the same as if it was a point charge, and the field is 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, Q of R squared R hat. We should know that because that's what we calculated in video number seven. So if the, the electric field is radial, that's a very important point because we're going to try and come up with uh, some symmetry. So in order to use Gauss's law, we need symmetry. So we need some sort of a surface because we're integrating with respect to a surface and we need it to have good symmetry. So what we need to come up with is it's known as a Gaussian, a Gaussian surface. And I said the symmetry, as you are FACE, I said the symmetry um, where, where we use Gauss's law is cylindrical symmetry, spherical symmetry, uh, axial or linear symmetry, uh, or plane symmetry, excuse me, plane symmetry, and there is one more that I can't think of off the top of my head. But the, the, that's essentially the only times that the Gauss's law work. So we're talking about a spherically charged conducting, a spherical charged conducting sphere, so we suggest that we take a sphere as our Gaussian surface. The sphere has a radius, we'll say, uh, capital R, and the, ra the, uh, what's it, the charged sphere has a radius of R. So we take the Gaussian surface to have a larger radius than the actual sphere itself. So what we need to do is look at the flux due to this charged conducting sphere on our Gaussian surface. That's what we're trying to do. So we take E dot dA. So E dot dA. Now, we know that E is radial, okay, of course, because it's a sphere, E has to be radial. And dA, we'll say, is also radial, because I showed you that a moment ago for a sphere. That means it's going to be E uh, dA cos 
of naught. In other words, it's just going to be the magnitude of E times the magnitude of dA. That is the dot product. So simply what we can do then is take the dot, take, we'll say, the electric field out and integrate dA. Okay? Now dA is going to be for a sphere, r squared, sine of theta, d theta, d phi. And of course, that's just going to be equal to 4 pi r squared. Okay? You're, I'm sure, well used to that at this stage. That's how we get the surface area of a sphere. Putting it all together, we get that the electric field for our charge conducting sphere multiplied by 4 pi r squared is equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon 0. Or we can rewrite it, E is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 q over r squared. And as I said, the electric field is in the r hat direction, so we can give the unit vector here like that. Alright, so notice we get the same answer as video number 7 without half the pain in the face. Uh, is there anything else I want to point out here? Okay, so the, just to reiterate the remarkable result of this, it's th that the field outside the sphere is exactly the same as it would have been if all the charge was concentrated at the centre. And that's a very important point. So if you ever get spherical symmetry, you can just get rid of the sphere and put down a point charge. And you'll get the, same, the exact same electric field. And while we're at it, just to point out, if it's not, if it isn't, we'll say, a, a uniformly charged sphere, or it's not full, we'll say, in say let, let's, for example, say it's a shell, and only the, the outer perimeter is, we'll say, uniform, and there's a gap or a empty space in the center, we find that the electric field outside is non-zero, but the electric field inside is zero. And we'll see more about that later on. That's the essence of a, a Faraday cage. All right, so that's all I've got to say about that. I hope that was interesting. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel, and you might also visit universityphysicstorials.com.